How do we warn future generations to avoid our buried nuclear waste? Please subscribe my channel like share and press the bell button. Fearsome monuments, color-changing cats, and atomic priesthoods have all been proposed as solutions. But warning humanity of this existential danger is much harder than it sounds. For around five decades, human beings have been burying nuclear waste deep underground, a radioactive legacy that may remain lethal for thousands of years. But with more than 20 nuclear repositories in consideration and development across the world, how will our descendants some 500 generations from now be able to identify where and what these sites are, and why they should avoid them? The problem has been tackled with proposals ranging from ominous monuments and atomic priesthoods to glowing cats, but it turns out that warning future humans of danger is much harder than it sounds. Top. Shipping containers for radioactive waste are seen in the parking lot outside the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, WIP, in New Mexico, 2014. L. Read more. Bottom. Workers convert the former Conrad Shaft iron ore mine in Salzgitter, Germany, into a nuclear waste repository. Burial of nuclear waste. Read more. For centuries in northeast Japan, for example, People have erected enormous stone tablets along the coast to warn future generations of tsunami threat. Despite declaring that nothing should be built below a certain point, many later residents ignored or forgot the warnings and built homes in vulnerable areas, paying a terrible price. More recently, the U.S. government standardized a universal warning sign for radiation in the 1950s, a trefoil of black blades on a yellow background but research suggests that as little as 6% of the world's population may actually recognize it. The Abyss of Deep Time A stone tablet in Anayoshi, Japan, warns residents not to build homes below the marker due to the threat of tsunamis. People have erected. Read more. In the early 1980s, as world governments and the nuclear industry became increasingly concerned about what to do about the long-term storage of radioactive waste, a new field of study developed, nuclear semiotics, the very broad, esoteric, and sometimes surreal study of how we will warn future humans, civilizations, or even post-human species, about our deadly legacy. The creation of nuclear semiotics is credited to a group of engineers, scientists, political scientists, psychologists, anthropologists, archaeologists, and more who worked on the Human Interference Task Force HITF. Formed by the U.S. Department of Energy and Bechtel Corp., in 1981, the task force took their cues from the monumental structures, sacred texts, and even curses that survive from ancient civilizations in order to come up with our society's largest conscious attempt to communicate across the abyss of deep time. The HITF decided that the most effective way to scare future generations was through the creation of enormous monuments around nuclear waste storage sites that were designed to evoke a sense of danger and dread. One proposed, stop sign, is a sprawling landscape of huge rock-like thorns emerging from the earth in every direction, while another suggests a sort of atomic, stonehenge, over the waste repository, comprised of huge granite columns marking its boundary, earthen ramparts round the facility's actual footprint, and a structure at its heart containing information about the site. Additional copies of the information would be buried around the site's self, and in stored archives around the world on special long-lasting paper, labeled with the perhaps optimistic administrative message, keep for 10,000 years. Even with equally chilling warning messages that could be carved into such creations. One example, this place is not a place of honor. No highly esteemed dead is commemorated here. Nothing valued is here. What is here was dangerous and repulsive to us. Monuments on such a scale are more likely than not to attract attention from the curious, the criminal, and even future archaeologists, and end up encouraging the very thing that they are supposed to prevent, the excavation of the site. The Egyptian pyramids are a case in point. They are still here, but the priests are long gone, and we ignore the terrible curses, looting their burial chambers and desecrating their dead. Ironically, one of the most pilloried proposals made to the HITF was that of a self-perpetuating, manipulative, atomic priesthood, with a designated elite who would employ myth, legend, and secretive ritual to create a sense of taboo around these sites for generations to come. 
The HITF ended their work in 1984, concluding that any successful attempt to communicate a warning across deep time will have to rely on monumental architecture and markers. Structures should be durable enough to require no maintenance for 10,000 years, and should be disturbing enough to inspire people to transmit knowledge about them, whether through oral legends or physical archives, across countless generations. Furry Geiger Counters A few years after the HITF was formed, writer Françoise Bastide and semiotician Paolo Fabri came up with a very different approach to keep future generations from our buried nuclear waste, the Ray Cat. In the future, they believed, cats could be bred to change color in the presence of radiation. The cats would then be released into the wild, and while generations of ray cats prowled the land, the story of the color-shifting felines and the danger they represent would be passed down to future human generations in folk tales and oral histories. Ray cats were thought to work better than, say, ray dogs or ray rats because of the supernatural associations humans have fairly consistently attached to cats across many cultures. The ancient Egyptians worshipped the cat god Bastet. The Vikings believed that two cats propelled the chariot of the goddess Freya, and in China, farmers worshipped the cat deity Li Sho who protected crops from rats and drove away evil spirits. The cat is also synonymous with independence and the freedom to go wherever it wants, which is useful for a furry, mobile Geiger counter. Looking at it through a scientific lens, a ray cat doesn't look too crazy to me says Kevin Chen, founder of Raycat Solution in 2015, a community of people who are fascinated by Bastides and Fabry's ideas and exploring the possibility of genetically engineering felines to glow through enzyme interaction. I mean it's crazy, but as crazy as the idea of bringing back the woolly mammoth. The concept is there, the technology doesn't necessarily exist today to do it, but along the way we will figure out how to do it and may gain other benefits from it. The Ray Cat has certainly inspired storytellers, visionaries, and artists to join Chen's embryonic movement with Ray Cat reverent t-shirts, songs, music videos, and even an award-winning documentary, The Ray Cat Solution. Thanks for watching.